Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Thanks for joining us today. While we know that most people who contract COVID-19 will be able to manage symptoms and to recover at home, some develop a more severe course of the illness and even require hospitalization. We've learned a lot about COVID-19 in the last nine months of this pandemic, and much of that has helped to improve treatment options for patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. Here to discuss this with us today is Dr. Raymond Razanable, an infectious disease specialist at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Razanable. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to join you. Well, this is such a pertinent time to be talking about patients hospitalized with COVID-19 because a very famous uh, patient happens to be hospitalized right now. And I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about the drugs that are used to treat COVID-19. We have learned a lot since the start of the pandemic. As you have said, this is now nine months going to 10 months since the start of this pandemic. We did not know what works before, but as a result of clinical trials that we have done through the past several months, including trials that was conducted here at Mayo, we know that the drug that works includes remdesivir. Remdesivir is an antiviral drug that was originally developed during the Ebola outbreak many years ago, uh, but this was done uh, and tested during this time, and in a controlled clinical trial, this is the clinical trial that basically assesses on whether a drug works or not, it was compared to a placebo or standard of care. And after the result has been assessed and analyzed, we now know that the administration of this drug called remdesivir hastens clinical recovery. For example, the time to clinical recovery is about 10 days for those who receive remdesivir, compare that to 15 days for those who receive the placebo. So as a result of that clinical trial, the FDA had issued an emergency use authorization for this drug, which means that providers can now use this drug to treat the patients with COVID-19 who are admitted in the hospital. Remember I say emergency use authorization because this is not a formal FDA approval, but as physicians, uh, we could use them when we see patients get admitted to the hospital. So that is one drug that is now available. It is given for five days and it can be extended to as long as 10 days in patients who are critically ill that require ventilator support, for example. The second drug that is also being used is called dexamethasone. This is a steroid, a steroid that we've been using for years in our clinical practice. In a clinical trial that was conducted uh, based in the United Kingdom, they noted that patients who receive dexamethasone actually have lower mortality compared to those who did not receive them. And then when we look at them as, as to which group really benefited from this, it is those individuals that require oxygen supplementation. So if you are sick enough to be admitted to the hospital and require oxygen support, dexamethasone may be a drug for you. And then the third drug that has emergency use authorization is called convalescent plasma. So this is blood uh, from patients that has recovered from COVID-19. So what we do is we isolate the plasma from that blood. This contains antibodies in the hope that the antibody present in this plasma is going to help and facilitate recovery. But in contrast to the dexamethasone as well as the, de the remdesivir, the, the use of convalescent plasma is more on a compassionate use basis. It has not been really subject, subjected into large randomized controlled clinical trials. So, but it is an option for patients who may not benefit from the other drugs. Well, like you said, it, it is amazing how much we have learned in nine months uh, to even know enough uh, to use the first two drugs. So that's just amazing. And that is true. We've learned a lot, but I think like we, we need to learn much more. There's still a lot of uncertainties about uh, this virus. And just like what I said, and what we've learned from the past is we know and we will learn from this on how to treat them if we do it the right way, which is to subject patients to uh, clinical trials uh, for uh, regimens that have not been proven uh, to be um, effective or still being investigational for that matter. Speaking of clinical trials, 
I understand that you are the principal investigator for Mayo Clinic on the Regeneron antibody study. Could you tell us a little about that? So this is monoclonal antibody. So antibody that has been developed against a receptor uh, or a protein uh, in the virus called S. We call them the spike protein. So what Regeneron has done is develop antibody that attaches to that receptor. This attachment between the S protein of the virus and the antibody prevents the virus from entering the cell. Because of that, it is being tested in controlled clinical trials. We don't know if it works, but the only way to find out is if we compare that with uh, a comparator such as a placebo. So here at Mayo, we are participating in this randomized controlled trial that is evaluating this monoclonal antibody, comparing that with placebo standard of care, and assess on whether this hastens recovery and this reduces mortality. But without the results of that, we, we, we don't know how it works. There is some preliminary signal that it may reduce viral load and that it may hasten recovery, but this is very preliminary. So I would you know, exercise caution in interpreting the results. So, but clinical trials are under, underway and hopefully we can find out the results quickly or sooner. Dr. Rosanable, are the antibodies that are used, are those something that are actually produced by the human body or can you make antibodies, I guess, artificially or in a lab? Uh, the convalescent plasma are those that are produced by the human body and then the uh, regenerous monoclonal antibody is actually the one that's produced in the lab. So two different options are, are available. Can you tell us about the clinical trials being done at uh, Mayo Clinic to help define guidance management and what that means? So Mayo Clinic has always had this policy since the start of the pandemic. Since we do not know what works, the only way to find out is to do them in controlled clinical trials. So we have always participated in these clinical trials for remdesivir, for example. So we were part of that, that basically defined that this drug works. We also participated in immunomodulatory trials. You know, if you remember early in the pandemic, uh, IL-6 inhibitors such as cerilumab and tocilizumab were very, very popular based on preliminary data coming from China. So here at Mayo, we also participated in clinical trials that assess them. And because of that, we know they don't work, okay? So in contrast to the popularity of these drugs before, because of the trials that we have conducted, including here at Mayo, we know that IL-6 inhibitors, tocilizumab and cerilumab do not work and should not be used, okay? And then we also have uh, trials with the use of steroids based on inflammatory markers, and then current ongoing trials now include the use of other immunologic compounds, including, saril, um, in, including ravilizumab, including uh, uh, lenzilumab that targets different receptors. And the purpose of this is when patients go into the so-called inflammatory process, this is when they deteriorate. And if you can stop that with the use of these compounds, hopefully the outcome will be better. And the classic example of that is dexamethasone, which we now use, but can other compounds do the same? The only way to find out is through controlled clinical trials, which we are doing here at Mayo. And then of course, the spike trial, the monoclonal antibody trial that we had discussed early on. This is something that we are also participating in, hopefully providing answers for the care of patients uh, in the future. Well, as you know, the whole world has been captivated this weekend and following the course of President Trump as he's been hospitalized after being diagnosed with COVID-19. And he has uh, reportedly received treatments with multiple of the therapies you've mentioned, including remdesivir, dexamethasone, and even Regeneron antibody therapy. Um, is it typical to use all three of those at once? And how do you decide which ones are appropriate? So the first line standard currently at this time is remdesivir. So for an individual to be admitted to a hospital that are sick enough uh, with symptoms, then remdesivir is the first line of treatment. Do we use dexamethasone for everybody? No, we use dexamethasone only for those that have findings of severe inflammation to require 
oxygen support. For example, if the oxygen saturation falls to less than 93% based on our evaluation, then we give dexamethasone. But if the patient is sick, but it's not requiring oxygen supplementation, then we do not give dexamethasone. With the use of the uh, Regeneron monoclonal antibody trial, I know that the president received that on a compassionate use basis. Our preference here at Mayo, however, is to use them on clinical trials, which means that patients may be randomized to either the cocktail of antibody or a placebo, because that's the only way we will find out on whether this really works or not. And since this cocktail has not really been approved, our preference at Mayo is to use them in a controlled clinical trial setting. You know, one of the things that has amazed me most about this pandemic is the way that groups have come to work together. So for instance, how contact tracing is done and how coordinated care has become. Could you tell us a little about how the collaborative workflow of functions at Mayo Clinic? I understand that there is a COVID treatment review panel that looks at the case of every patient who's admitted to the hospital. So a COVID management is very complicated because first, uh, initially, we don't know what works, and now there are different options that are available. Uh, some are proven, some are not. So at Mayo, we have developed this COVID treatment review panel that basically reviews all admissions once or twice a day by virtually, as well as constantly throughout the day through uh, electronic communication to see on what works best for every single patient. So this is a team that is composed of infectious disease physicians, just like me, critical care specialists are members of the team, and we, may, we meet every day, uh, including holidays, Saturdays, and Sunday, uh, to basically discuss every patient that gets admitted. And what we decide on is what drug would work best, what clinical trials the patient may be approached to consented for part participation if they are interested. That way, it's a very streamlined process, this is a team that supports the infectious diseases COVID service, for example. We support the pulmonary and hospital uh, teams that uh, admits these patients, including those that are admitted in the intensive care unit. So all these teams basically rely on this COVID treatment panel to guide them as to what works. And as you would imagine, it's now been you know over nine months since the start of this treatment panel. So the people that are member of this treatment panel really are considered the experts in the management of COVID and has benefited really uh, the patients that are admitted to this institution. Dr. Rasanabla, do you compare notes in any structured way with physicians or providers at other institutions, even within the Mayo system, or is it primarily through looking at the research that's coming? We do compare notes. So we learn from others. There are uh, trials that are being conducted by other institutions, for example, so we learn from them. The trials that we do here, we disseminate so that they can learn from us. And within the Mayo enterprise, for example, there's this collaboration among the, the sites, like for example, the uh, treatment panel that I mentioned earlier, there are three different uh, panels across the three major sites in Florida, Arizona, and Rochester. What are some of the parameters you use to decide whether a patient needs to come into the hospital or whether they should stay at home? Uh, most of the time, it's the oxygen saturation that falls to less than 94%. Sometimes the patients are just having difficult breathing. So it, it, with, that, with that situation that they get admitted. They get too weak, for example, because a large part of the signs and symptoms is nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And because of that, people do get you know, uh, really weak when staying at home. So some of those would require to be um, admitted to the hospital. But the major one is really how are they breathing at home? Are they saturating well? Uh, and uh, that is usually the indication of whether we need to get the patients into the hospital or not. This has been absolutely fascinating to visit with you today. And thank you so much for your time, Dr. Razanable. Our thanks today to Dr. Raymond Razanable, Mayo Clinic Infectious Disease Specialist, sharing with us about the care of COVID-19 patients who are hospitalized. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did. We wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. 
Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.